Okay, good morning everybody. Oh, I'm assuming that this is not loud enough. Okay, can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Sort of, more loud, louder. Okay, good. All right, good morning. Thanks for coming back. So that's three down, two to go. So we're going to have a little bit of a look now at circadian rhythms and sleep and um, how they relate to our health or the opposite of a spectrum disease. So quickly we'll have a look at, we can't get away from this question, how much sleep. I don't want to focus on it too much because I think being obsessed with the duration is maybe not quite the right idea, but we have to look at it. Um, we'll look at what happens with circadian and sleep disruption and your risk for cardiometabolic disease. We'll have a quick look at uh, circadian rhythm, sleep and your immune system. And then again, using exercise as the um, paradigm for looking at a healthy setting, we'll look at sleep's role in optimizing physical performance. Okay. So we get this question all the time. People want to know. So maybe just quick show of hands. Who's getting around, or who's getting six or less hours of sleep per night? Holy smokes, okay. <laughs> and anyone getting sort of nine, ten or more? Oh, me. <laughs> okay. So in 2015, the National Sleep Foundation in the US published some guidelines relating to sleep duration. Um, it's, it was based on um, a massive review of all the current literature which is linking um, sleep duration with um, health outcomes. So this is not, I must admit, um, impress upon you, this is not a thumb suck. And essentially they've come up with this nice colorful schematic, but here we are in um, older adults, um, sort of six, well, between 26 and 64 and then above 65, we need seven to nine or seven to eight hours of sleep per night. That's to promote optimal health. So the blue is, is what is recommended. According to these guidelines, they've got these little nice light blue sections over here. So 26 to 64, they say six to 10, and five to six and nine for the older adults. Those are the might be appropriate ranges because they recognize that it's not eight hours for every human. That's ridiculous. My needs are different to your needs, but my needs today are different to my needs when I'm um, training for an event or under high pressure at work. So, and they even change with seasons. So I like the fact that there is flexibility in these guidelines to account for that. Um, and then anything on either side of that is deemed to be not appropriate. Looking at it in a little bit more depth, at exactly the same time, um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society also um, did a similar um, exercise and came up with very similar guidelines. And this is based on what's called a consensus statement. So they have this enormous panel of sleep experts and it has to be representative of people from um, different disciplines and different um, countries around the world. And they start off with their preconceived ideas around how much sleep is recommended for different conditions, and then via review of the literature, which is a, just is a, takes months, this process, they then eventually reconvene and um, come up with a consensus on what the panel decides is appropriate. So when you look at um, how to sort of interpret this consensus statement, in terms of hours to sleep, um, so here the general consensus is that this is the acceptable range, so somewhere between seven to nine hours. And the way that it's coded, I hope you can see this from the side, but green is appropriate. The whole panel agreed that that is the range that is appropriate for optimal health. Where it's yellow, then the panel is uncertain um, and there's some disagreement. Uh, where it's a little bit white here, it's inappropriate to uncertain, so there's disagreement, and then this is deemed to be inappropriate and the panel agreed that upon that. So when they looked at the different categories, they looked at here general health. So you can see that the consensus very much in the green area here is that looking at 79 is good for optimal health. Certainly anything less than six and perhaps even six to seven is not indicated to optimize health. And then this is where there's uncertainty. So the difference between these guidelines and the previous ones is that the previous ones had a problem with too long and, and too short. These guidelines, 
say, well, definitely too short is not good, and we don't yet understand too long, so we're going to leave it as uncertain now. And I'll explain a little bit about that now. And then they looked at different um, outcomes. So cardiovascular health, um, there's a little bit more uncertainty around the, short, around the shorter sleep year, but generally 79. Metabolic health, mental health, um, immune function, human performance, breast cancer. So there was absolutely really no agreement here, which either means that the literature is insufficient currently, or there is perhaps no link between sleep and breast cancer, for example. They also looked at pain, which I thought was interesting, and it's becoming more common, and then mortality. Now, mortality is interesting because here, um, it's tricky to interpret this, but there's a definite increase of mortality with longer sleep. Um, and so, <laughs> what we are... <laughs> I think that the differences between short and long sleep are, are very different. I think short sleep is generally an imposed restriction, generally. I mean, I understand that some people can't sleep, but even the people who have insomnia will often be trying to have very long sleep durations. They just won't get good quality sleep. But when it comes to short sleep duration, that's often a lifestyle choice, I feel. Where it, when, it, when it comes to long sleep, I don't think there's a single person that would say, I choose to sleep 10 or 11 hours a day. What a waste of time. You must be doing that because there's a need. And I think that there's an underlying illness, and we know that when you are not well and you have high levels of cytokines, you have a lot higher um, levels of fatigue. And so that could be driving, just for example, this longer sleep. So I think that that's possibly why this this funny relationship exists between long and short sleep, both having high mortality, but I think the reasons are quite different. So their message, instead of saying 79 hours is what we need and for 6 to 10 is appropriate for most people, they said you should be sleeping 7 or more. So they don't put an upper cap on it. And this is to promote optimal health. And then their caveat is that sleeping more than 9 hours per night on a regular basis may be appropriate for young adults because of the growth, and individuals recovering from sleep debt for obvious reasons, or individuals with illness for the reason I just mentioned. For others, it's uncertain if sleeping more than hours, nine hours per night is associated with health risk. So that's generally the message that's going out now. We have a very interesting situation in South Africa. I've been trying to get an idea of what South African sleep looks like. And um, in this particular study that I've had um, been a part of, it's really um, looked at South Africans, but our black South Africans, and it's part of a five country study where they are comparing um, a whole lot of things. It's really looking at metabolic effects, but I've stolen the sleep data from it. Um, and they've compared it to f uh, five um, countries with black populations who are, the countries are at different um, points along the spectrum of, of, kind of wealth, if you like. So essentially, um, going in, um, in order here of, um, of development of the country, there's Ghana, South Africa, Jamaica, Seychelles, and the US. So it's not a massive study. There's 200, 250 odd per, per, um, per ex um, country, and these are males and females. But what's just crazily um, stand out here, this is sleep duration, and the red are the South Africans, and I've plotted the individual data points just so that you can see how, how varied it is, because that's quite normal. But we stick out like a sore thumb in both the males and the females with this really long sleep duration. And um, in the US, for example, and the Seychelles, they're sort of averaging here at around six, six to seven hours per night, whereas in the South Africans, we're averaging more like 10 in this, in this black South African cohort. So it's very, very different. Um, and this is, this is self-report data, this particularly, but we've now had this backed up with measured data as well. So it's not just, I don't understand the question or anything like that. And I've repeated this in, um, in urban townships, in rural settings. So it's quite, it's quite diverse. And we keep coming up with the same information. Um, so the question is, does that reflect a greater sleep need biologically by, by these um, South Africans? Is it associated with lower socioeconomic status? Because you could potentially argue, well, if the majority of this population is unemployed, and there are 70 to, 80, 70 to 75 percent of that, of that group are unemployed, then perhaps there's less to do, 
and perhaps there's more time to sleep. Um, and then, of course, there's also the issues around neighborhood safety, because if you don't feel safe, in the, these are from the conversations I've had with participants, they will be indoors sooner after the sun has gone down um, to, to increase safety, which might then lead to going to bed earlier if there's not much else to do. Or is it just underpinned by society or cultural specific beliefs or values placed on sleep? So these are all the kinds of things I'd like to disentangle in the next couple of years. But um, what was quite interesting in a big study that was conducted in the US using um, some uh, NIH data, they looked at sleep duration and risk for cardiometabolic disease. So they created a composite score, um, a little bit similar to the metabolic syndrome score um, for um, cardiometabolic disease. And they plotted that. So this here is, is your risk for disease. And this here, oh, Sherbet, sorry, is sleep duration. Um, Okay, so let me just explain. This, it, it looks a bit messy, but let's just focus on this black line over here. Um, so basically, this is a higher risk, and this direction is a lower risk. And based on this cross-sectional observational study, so there's no cause and effect here, what they notice is that around seven hours, sort of seven, eight, um, is associated with the lowest risk for disease in that particular group. When they then separated it out by um, different ethnic groups, they noticed this. This here is the non-Hispanic whites, so we're still looking good for risk at around seven hours per night, whereas this actually drops mathematically down to eight hours per night in the non-Hispanic blacks. So it's some of the first evidence that at least not just in South Africa, but in the US, potentially, there's a link between sleep duration and risk for cardiometabolic disease, and that the nature of that relationship might differ by ethnicity. So at least it's a little bit of help for us to try to understand why our black South Africans are such long sleepers. And of course, that's got um, consequences down the line as people become more, um, firstly, more urbanized, but secondly, as SES improves, um, living conditions, of course, going to change. Working conditions will change, and potentially the opportunity for sleep will be reduced, which means that the future burden of disease, if there is indeed a reason to have longer sleep, is going to be difficult to manage if, um, if sleep duration is reduced. Okay. Um, so essentially, we could say that maybe longer sleep in black South Africans is actually protective of health in that particular instance. But that's the work that I'll be doing in the next couple of years, and we'll, I'll let you know how that turns out. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so I haven't personally, but one of my collaborators from psychology, Gosha Lipinska, that's what she does. Um, she's, oh, sorry, links between post-traumatic stress um, disorder, PTSD, and sleep. And the... Um, huge numbers of the groups that she's looked at living in the urban um, low-income settings obviously have post-traumatic stress disorder and it, it, it is associated with poorer quality sleep, um, not necessarily a difference in duration. But I, So part of my thinking is that if you suffer from PTSD and you have poor quality sleep, you might try to compensate by having longer sleep so that you can still feel better. But um, that's some work that we're going to continue um, in this year and next year. Okay, so let's have a look at this link between sleep circadian rhythms and, and disease. So there is bucket loads of evidence out there which shows that if you reduce or disturb, and I'm, I really want to make that point clear, that because I kind of sometimes forget to specify this, that. It's not just sleep duration. Sleep quality is probably more important than, than, than duration. Because quality, if it's poor quality sleep, it probably alters the structure of your sleep, which means that your opportunity to repair or for your immune system to work or for your um, emotional recovery to take place might be Im impeded. So if you reduce um, or have poor quality sleep, you have increased risk for cardiometabolic disease. That's an absolute given. And it seems to be a bi-directional relationship in that as the diseases progress, sleep is often further worsened, which is a bit unfortunate. Similarly, there's a huge amount of evidence which shows that if you disrupt circadian rhythms, you also increase risk for cardiometabolic disease, again, a bidirectional relationship. And then as we know, there's also 
um, a very tight association between sleep and circadian rhythms, so that as you disturb sleep, and particularly shift sleep timing, you can alter the body clock, and with a, um, a disturbed or broken um, body clock, you can impair, impair your sleep. And the most important message is that both short and long sleep, less than six, more than 10 hours, is definitely associated with an increased all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. So it's quite difficult when we think about uh, sleep and circadian disruption. Uh, we often want to try to say, well, which one came first? Is it the chicken or it's a good old chicken or egg scenario? Um, and it's probably quite a good question because both are associated with very similar negative health outcomes. In fact, this is just a sample of, um, of titles from various journals that have been recently published, but there's a huge amount of interest in um, circadian and sleep um, biology and um, metabolic disease. So this is adverse metabolic and cardiovascular consequences of circadian misalignment. Genetic variants of clock transcription factor are associated with individual susceptibility to obesity. The chronobiology, etiology, and pathophysiology of obesity. So obesity is now not just, just soma, a lifestyle disease, but it's definitely got a circadian aspect to it. Chronobiology, genetics, and metabolic syndrome. A time to, to fast and a time to feast. That's a crosstalk between metabolism and the circadian clock. And so we go on. And really what you can see is that there's a lot of work that's being done to look at how sleep and circadian rhythms are associated with metabolism and cardiometabolic um, disease. And a huge area, which I'm not going to go into now, which is really coming to the fore, is related to the gut. And we know that the gut's important for obviously metabolism as well as the immune system. And it seems that the clock in the gut is absolutely critical. And that the bacteria in the, in the gut, um, the composition varies with a circadian-like profile. And that keeping the clock gut intact is actually seems to be very important for healthy metabolism and healthy immune systems. So in terms of the chicken or egg argument, which comes first, sleep disruption or circadian disruption. So it could be the chicken. And the example there would be to have a look at um, shift workers, because that's a nice natural example. And there you have to purposefully disrupt your um, circadian rhythm to accommodate working during your natural sleep hours. And one of the primary consequences amongst shift workers is um, chronic sleep deprivation and, and insufficiency. And this review here just shows some of the, um, um, the known outcomes in terms of long-term um, shift work. So obviously there's circadian disruptions, and these are observed in body temperature, respiration, hormones, menstrual cycle, urine excretion, cell division. So this is um, quite clear. There's, then it's associated also with mental health um, issues around stress, anxiety, depression, burnout, for example. It's got direct effects on sleep, so sleep loss, of course, a reduction in REM sleep in stage two, which is where we should have most of our sleep, so it indicates sleep fragmentation. Um, some fatigue, obviously, a reduced brain volume. There's an increased risk for um, cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of GI disorders that go along with it. Um, increased risk for breast and colorectal cancer, and then some rep rep reproductive effects as well. However, it could also be the egg, because in this very neat experiment here, they looked at what happens if we um, purposefully sleep deprive people for one week, what will happen to their circadian biology. So in this particular experiment, they came into the laboratory and they were given two nights of eight hour sleep opportunities and 16 hour awake periods. Then they were given um, really um, big sleep opportunities here. They did 10 hour sleep opportunities for the entire week. They didn't have to necessarily sleep for that entire time. But believe me, if you go into a lab and you're given that time to sleep and there's not much else to do, it's not that difficult, especially if you have some residual sleep debt. And then they measured a number of things at the end. They put them into what is known as a constant routine. So in circadian um, research, we use a constant routine to a little bit simulate the cave-like experiment. So you'll be in very, very low levels of light. It's usually about 10 lux and you'll have to be seated or very sedentary for that entire period. And it usually takes about 36 hours or so to conduct the experiment. And we basically just let your, um, in that we measure mostly melatonin and a couple of other factors to look at what your free running or innate circadian rhythm would look like. 
So they did that and they measured a number of other factors too. Then they gave them a big fat recovery sleep of 12 hours and sent them home. And then they came in um, uh, after a washout period and then they had the same two eight hour run in sleep periods. And then for this um, week on the sleep restriction protocol, they were given only six hour sleep opportunities. And they did that for a week. Constant routine again, recovery sleep. So what did they see? This was just one week of insufficient sleep. So the average measured there was about 5.7 hours per night. And they noticed that 711 genes were either up or down regulated compared to in their sleep replete state. And these were, genes were associated with your circadian rhythm, sleep homeostasis, oxidative stress, and metabolism. And some of the main biological processes that were um, affected were those associated with chromatin remodeling, gene expression regulation, macromolecular metabolism, as well as the inflammatory, immune, and stress responses. So, of this knowledge and uh, yeah, knowledge uh, raises the question: How the management of night shift workers should be? What action should they take mm. to prevent, if possible, some of the effects? Yeah, you're right. This but is. There, there will be people who will have to work during the night. Absolutely, it's unavoidable at this point in in our. Um, in our history. Hopefully it's going to be taken over by machines in the future. But in the meantime, um, especially in Australia, because they are incredibly um, <laughs> careful about health and safety, so they've taken this information incredibly seriously into their hospital systems and there's a huge amount of work that is being done to see how they can operationalize safer schedules for um, shift workers. Um, part of it has got to do with obviously in, um, sh increasing the number of people available to work so that they can have shorter shifts because typically shift workers they do 12 hour shifts um, which is obviously a part of the problem. Um, so they're looking at shifting to three eight hour sets of shifts for example so that you can have um, um, more time for recovery and then they're also experimenting with um, whether or not you put night owls on night shifts, for example, morning people on, on, on morning shifts. The problem is that when you often, when I speak to shift workers, and it doesn't matter if they're working in a bread factory or they're a doctor in a hospital, shift work is a part of their life because either they need the work or it's what they do. And they're mostly willing to do it because this is what they've, this is what, this is what, this is what they do. So it's often actually the workers themselves or the employees who who say, well, I'm fine to do this, um, whereas the companies are almost getting more concerned. Yeah. There, is, there are possibilities of uh, intervening in trying to prevent adverse effects. Yeah. By Absolutely. And the airlines is another one that's taking it very seriously now, too. Okay, so just a little bit of, um, of how sleep actually, or reduced or poor quality sleep actually fits into this whole um, metabolic conundrum. So this is, um, it's a model uh, drawn up um, by, based on review of all the current evidence. So this is not necessarily absolutely how everything works, but based on the current evidence, this is how we think things are, are working at the moment. So the evidence suggests that in, with shorter sleep, there's a change in a number of hormones, but specifically leptin and ghrelin and orexin, which are associated with your hunger um, or sensations of hunger or fullness. So essentially, with shorter sleep, there will be um, you will have increased ghrelin levels, and ghrelin promotes um, the sensation of hunger, and lower leptin levels, which means potentially less satiety. And the other, um, so obviously those might combine to increase the perception that you need to eat more by increasing appetite. By the same, on the other side, there are a number of melatonin and thyroid stimulating hormones um, change too, which can alter energy balance and potentially lower um, energy expenditure in those who are sleep deprived. So kind of associated with a uh, slower metabolism. And of course, with those two together, that potentially might put a person at risk for weight gain and ultimately obesity. Once obesity is in place, um, there's quite good evidence to suggest that either through the obese-related lifestyle habits or depression or stress, that then stress is further exacerbated. Very often, people are, who are obese will develop um, obstructive sleep apnea, 
which will further re um, reduce their sleep. And then they also get what we call a, re a change in their circadian amplitude, um, which can also further Im um, reduce sleep. So by that, I mean, so if you think about how we measured, let's just take core body temperature as one particular example, and we want a nice, robust circadian amplitude, and that is often um, squashed down. Whether on um, what exactly causes it, we don't know. In part, we see that their actual sleep-wake cycle changes quite a lot. And instead of being nice and consistent with bedtimes, wake-up times, and sleep duration, individuals who are obese very often have a lot more variation in their sleep-wake habits, which can also um, reduce the circadian amplitude. And then on the other side of things, there's a number of hormones which change to basically um, increase your um, inflammatory environment and also have a lot, that whole balance that I spoke about yesterday between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system changes as well. And this inflammatory environment, and this is probably really the key, um, increases risk, um, risk for insulin resistance as does, as does obesity, which is obviously a, a risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes. And then similar for obesity, the condition of diabetes itself and its symptoms can then further exacerbate sleep. So it's been proposed that there's like an interacting epidemic here between reduced sleep, obesity, and diabetes. Just going to hop back into the South African picture because I like to keep it a little bit relevant. Um, I think that it's quite interesting that now um, mortality in South Africa is um, more attributed to non-communicable diseases than um, communicable diseases. So 50% of deaths annually in South Africa are now due to NCDs. Um, when we look at all South Africans, irrespective of gender or ethnicity, TB is still the highest sort of killer, followed by type 2 diabetes now. Um, what's interesting though is when we compare men and women, TB is responsible for more deaths than men, but diabetes is responsible now for the most number of deaths in women. And where this is coming from is our obesity epidemic that we have in South African women. You can see here that currently 25% of South African women are overweight and 40% are classified as obese. So we have a massive obesity issue, um, which is only going to feed into this, I fear, um, in the future. So that's going to really change the nature of our burden of disease in South Africa. The men are a little bit um, less concerning at this point, but um, since we are a country in the middle of transition, um, sort of in, terms along, in terms of epidemiology, the chances are quite well that we'll follow other first world countries and have an increase in obesity if we don't do something quite soon. So, yeah. Is that kilograms Kilograms, kilograms. No? So, so, so say you're five from five. Yes? Okay, sorry, so this is based on your body mass index. Sorry, this is body mass index over here. Okay, so, sorry, I didn't, I made that assumption. Okay, so if you're overweight, your BMI, body mass index, will be 25 to 29.9, and if it's over 30, you're classified as obese, and your body mass index is, um, it's your weight divided by your height in meters squared. So it's a relatively simple calculation to do um, if you know those two bits of information. So it does account for height, yeah. So could you go back one slide? Another one? Another one? Yeah, that one. Uh, did you mention we'll talk about the increase in causes? Could you talk about that? So we, th yeah, we, we think that that's part of a, almost a stress response. Um, again, probably largely related to the autonomic nervous system, um, which, um, and I think that there's probably um, overstimulation of the um, HPA axis, um, and that's probably what's causing this increase in cortisol, but we're not really sure. Because presumably that, that would cause the Well, yeah, absolutely. High levels of cortisol do um, do promote lack of um, or insomnia. That yeah, that's absolutely right. But I think it's not just a direct relationship, as well. I think that there's quite a lot else that's happening to create this almost this inflammatory environment. Um, yeah, you know, anyone who's been on cortisol medication will will know what happens to sleep. Okay. 
So typically when we look at reducing um, obesity, we look at lifestyle choices and it's been hammered into us over the years that you have to be more active and eat healthily and avoid sedentary behavior and certainly avoid um, smoking. And I would just like to um, suggest that it's way past time that we need to include sleep in that, in that arsenal. I'm not gonna be silly enough to say that it's just all about sleep because that's quite ridiculous. Um, there, there's, there's many aspects to this game here, but I certainly believe that sleep needs to be considered in conjunction with these other lifestyle changes. I just wanna show you a couple of examples of the research which has looked at um, what happens uh, in particular studies um, where there's insufficient sleep. So in this particular study here, they, did, they again looked at five days of insufficient sleep on energy expenditure and energy intake compared to adequate sleep. What I like about these five day studies is that it really is easy for us to relate to because it's just one crazy week at work or something like that. It's something that we probably all go through quite regularly. This was a 15, patient, a 15 day inpatient study. They had 16 adults, 22, so relatively young. Habitual sleep around eight hours, that's quite decent. Um, they were lean with these BMIs here and um, this is what they observed in the, in the study. So they were given either nine or five hour sleep opportunities um, in each week of the study. And then they measured 24 hour energy expenditure and you can see quite clearly here that the energy expenditure um, over a 24 hour period is higher in the um, shorter sleepers. The reason being is that when you're awake for longer, you are, your, your basal metabolic rate has to be higher because when you sleep, your metabolic rate drops down. So there's, you're active for more hours in the day. They looked at their, sorry about the, the unclear writing here. This says five day average food intake in terms, and this is measured in kilocalories per day. This is the longer sleeping group and that's the um, shorter sleeping group. So you can see that the calorie intake was significantly higher in the, um, sorry, I'm getting feedback on this thing, in the short sleeping group. Then they looked at the energy balance. So the difference between intake and expenditure and they, they both groups were taking in more calories than, than what they needed to expend in that week but the energy balance, the positive balance was higher, um, although not significant, but in the um, short sleeping group. And then over that week, this is weight gain here in kilograms, and the um, shorter sleeping group gained about, um, about 0.8 of a kilogram in those five days, compared to about two kilograms in the other group. So the authors concluded that insufficient sleep for the period of one week increases your total energy expenditure by about 5%, but energy intake was increased in excess of what was required, and that resulted in an increase in weight gain. There's also been quite a lot of interest in how um, your chronotype is associated with metabolism. So there's some research to show that eveningness, or people who are um, classified as, as owls, um, have low, l lower dietary restraint, less healthful dietary habits, and a tendency for a higher BMI. Um, and in another particular study where they looked at people who were obese and sleep deprived, so that was the, that was the nature of the cohort, and then they specifically just, they separated out by eveningness or morningness, and they found that those who, in that group who um, were owls, had higher levels of stress hormones, higher resting heart rates, more apnea, lower HDLC levels and a tendency towards higher BMI. So those are just two little sort of snippets just to show you some of the, of the evidence there. So it's certainly quite clear in, in my mind from the evidence that is currently available that um, metabolism or metabolic health and, and indeed your risk for cardiometabolic disease is associated with short sleep and with disrupted circadian rhythms. So that's really the take home message there. So I have a brief look here at the circadian immune connection. So um, Rahima would have introduced you to the metabolic clock um, on, on day one. So this here is, our, is, is, the, um, is the metabolic clock. That's our little interacting network of clock genes. And obviously the um, clock control genes, whether they are located in the SCN or anywhere else in the body, are, pardon me, sorry, are, um, have 24-hour oscillations. 
And so it's not surprising that the immune cells, also, which obviously also contain the, um, the clock genes, also have 24-hour oscillations. And so the output is that the immune pathways and the immune output has um, a circadian rhythmicity to it. And it seems to have effects on disease efficacy, on um, treatment efficacy, susceptibility, and symptoms. And I'll show you what I mean by that now. So on one hand, it seems that the time of day at which you're exposed to a pathogen influences whether or not you will develop a given condition. So because, um, let me give you this example here. So they injected mice with E. coli, and they did it either in their sleep or in their um, inactive or their wake phase. And they noticed that there was an 80% mortality if they were infected in their, in, in their inactive phase, but it was below 20% if they were um, if, um, infected in their activity phase. And this relates a little bit to what I mentioned the other day around that your immune system has different components and it seems that the component which is defending against pathogens is more active in your, in your wake phase. Um, compared to in your inactive phase. And it makes me wonder, and I haven't read any evidence or research for this, but it's some, probably a study that needs to be done around airline travel. You know how many people get sick when they travel? And obviously we're in a very confined space, so we must be exposed to a lot more pathogens than normal. And it just makes me wonder if daytime versus nighttime flights are better in terms of our reduced risk for becoming sick. I have no evidence for that statement whatsoever. It's just amusing, but um, it wouldn't make too much, it would make some sense to me, certainly. Um, this also just shows here the, the association between developing um, uh, um, illness based on your sleep hours per night. So um, this here is average sleep duration. This is less than five, five to six, six to seven, or more than seven hours per night. And this is the chances of catching the common cold. So they, what they did is that they swabbed um, the participants with um, the, the rhinovirus, and then they waited to see who actually developed symptoms. And essentially, those that slept less than five hours per night were four and a half times more likely to develop symptoms than those who slept seven hours as a control condition. There's also some evidence that the um, time of that symptom onset is associated with time of day. Um, and this is possibly, uh, so this is quite nicely illustrated in, in asthma patients. So the majority of symptoms are typically experienced at night. Um, the daily rhythm of bronchial constriction seems to be greatest at nighttime, somewhere between midnight and eight in the morning. And um, it's probably not a coincidence that that is therefore when most respiratory failures occur. And so there is some thinking that perhaps the administration time um, of, of a medication before bed is probably more effective than any other time of day, and indeed that is what is typically prescribed. There's also variation in the effectiveness of drugs and um, with respects to um, both desired and undesired. Um, so for example, it seems that there's temporal variation at the time of day at which we are able to absorb, metabolize, and excrete drugs. And it seems that many tissues and cells have tem temporal variations in their responses to drugs which, um, which do reach them. All right, so I want to leave the disease-ish side aside now and just have a quick look at um, sleep and performance because I think it's always nice to have a look at the healthy side as well, just to remind ourselves. Yeah. No, no, not, no, not. So snoring is very often a, um, yeah, it's, it's a precursor or a, an, can be a precursor, it's a marker of potential future obstructive sleep apnea. And then what we find is that people who have sleep apnea will often do quite long sleep because their sleep is so broken and they're trying to get the benefits of it. But there's not a direct relationship between snoring and duration. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so maybe he's. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, snoring is usually associated with. I mean, it's, it's resistance in the upper airways, and it's very often associated with inflammation in the sinuses. 
And if um, some people who are, I hate this argument, but some people who are gluten um, sensitive will tell you that they have a lot more sinusy symptoms when they snore and so, I mean, when they eat um, gluten, so it's potentially that the snoring is exacerbated by that. I love pasta though. <laughs> <laughs> because when you take people who maybe are heavy bones or well muscled, as opposed to have very little fat, yeah. in that measurement they've come across as a piece and they clearly are not. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. And um, the people who are disadvantaged by the measurement would be your rugby player type guy. Very tall, a lot of muscle, weighs a lot. So, what we typically do to strengthen the, the measurement is to incorporate, um, we, we there's a second part, which I didn't explain because it's too complicated, but we put waist circumference in as well. And there are waist circumference cutoffs for, for men and for women. So you need to have a BMI of X plus a waist circumference of greater than that. Because the waist circumference is t generally giving us an indication of abdominal obesity, which is really what we're trying to get to. So the measurement is stronger with waist circumference in there. And it's, I think it's 80 centimeters for women and 88 for men. So it's quite, it's quite big. So you can have a BMI of 32, which would classify you as obese, but if your waist circumference is as a male below, the, below 88, then you will not be classified as obese. Good point. Yes. So an, any endocrine uh, explanation for uh, the symptom that people get sleepy after a big meal? Hmm. So not, I mean, not, not really. There is a drop off in cortisol afterwards, but I don't think that that's it. I, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> he's full, yeah. he's too. Yeah. It's a funny question, but it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it would be interesting if there was a possibility of indicating that the hormonal effects uh, of having a meal uh, yeah. as a result of that, that you get sleepy. Yeah, so there's, some people have looked at it, but there isn't anything solid yet, but they'll, they, they say, for example, that certain foods promote sleepiness, and it's got to do with releasing um, uh, tryptophan, for example, which is a precursor for, um, ultimately down the line, for melatonin. But I think it's too much of a stretch. So, for example, they'll say you should eat bananas because they're high in tryptophan and that will promote sleep, and I think that's absolute junk. And then other people will say that pro me meals that are higher in protein don't promote sleepiness, but meals that are high in carbohydrate do. Um, it's possible that they do, but I'm not sure why. Yeah, yeah. there was a question here. So yeah. oh, I'm coming now. Yeah. So I just wanted to say about the, uh, the snoring and the mucous membrane inflammation, which is always increased whenever there is sugar. So carbohydrate breaks down into sugar. Yeah. Natural yeah. So that is why. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Normally it's said that the breakfast should be a big meal and lunch sort of moderate and supper should be the smallest meal. Yeah. Yeah, that's also a great question. I really wanted to get into that today, but I was gonna I was kind of running out of time, but I'm so I'm happy to chat about that now quickly. Um the short of it is that we're designed to eat when the sun is up. So eating a large meal at the end of the day or very late is, is not a great gain and not a great idea. Um, did I tell you about the, I, I'm getting lost as to what I've told you already. Did I tell you about the, the study in the rats where they fed them at different times of the day? No, let me tell you and that'll help answer this question. Um, so they've done, uh, they basically gave the rats ad libitum access to food um, for, the, for a period of three or four weeks and they um, either had access in their active phase or in their sleep phase. And um, they measured the amount of calories that they took in over that period and there was no difference between the two rat groups, those that ate in the, the, the sleep phase or the wake phase. But the rats who ate in their inactive phase became obese as the experiment went by, despite the calorie intake being the same. So the point is, is that we are not designed to be eating in our inactive phase. And um, having a large meal at the end of the day, especially very late, we don't seem to handle that very well. So I don't think that that is typically recommended. So the, the old thing of having a bigger breakfast certainly seems to be better. And the other reason for that is we speak about wanting to create a nice, robust circadian rhythm. 
And remember, meal timing is one of the, um, the zeitgebers for your circadian rhythm, in addition to light and physical activity. And so by using meal times, you can signal to your body that it's active or day phase. So we like to have meals in the morning and in the daytime to keep signaling to the body that it's, that it's our active phase. And we like to minimize that signal at the end of the day or towards in, in the dark phase. Yeah, we we'll want to be careful about saying that like, from a biological perspective, because there's a social and the biological aspect of, of eating and meals, but from a biological aspect, it doesn't seem to be a great idea. Um, but I, I always, so, so, so personally, I don't think it's a great idea, but I do think that we have to, we have to be a little bit careful because I can say categorically, this is associated with that. For example, eating a big meal, and then you could, you have a person who's an absolute waif who only eats massive meals at the end of the day and they're like, well, they happen to be the exception, but they will look at me. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with, with my metabolism and my weight. So I think people who are sensitive to weight gain would do well to experiment with time of day of eating. Does that make sense? Cool. You have to be careful the way you say it. Yes. Um, so there, there is some, there is an indication that it might, specifically in terms of with feelings of sleepiness and sleep onset. Um, but at the end of the day, you're then also giving confusing signals to your body because you've given it food to signal, please, prime metabolism. But then you are also putting yourself into darkness and going to sleep, which is saying, please, slow my, metabol um, my metabolic rate down. So I think that there's confusion. So I think it's more the problem is what it's doing to your metabolism than anything else. Not necessarily, not necessarily. I haven't got any evidence for that, so I can't say. Sorry. <laughs> I will definitely have a look at that in the future, though, because it's clearly quite an important avenue. Okay. Right. So Maria Sharapova, you may remember her for some years ago. She says that when it comes to special prep for tournaments, the only thing that she does differently is I'm resting. Sleeping longer is the only thing I do. I love to sleep, it's my hobby. Sam Bolt says it's extremely important to him. He needs to rest and recover in order for the training I do to be absorbed by my body. Michael Phelps, if you remember the guy with the big feet, it's not just the quality of sleep that matters, but it's also, it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality. And how's this Roger Federer apparently says if he doesn't sleep 11 to 12 hours a night, it's just not right. Um, <laughs> so the key is that, um, and he's got two sets of twins. Yeah, he's <laughs> so obviously got a very good setup at home. <laughs> the key is that sports people seem to value sleep. This is just an example of some relatively well-known sports people here. This is hours of sleep. This is what most people are getting somewhere around seven. And you can see here that the um, athletes are regularly getting well over that, except for one notable exception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so pros take sleep seriously. In fact, um, this guy, Nick Little Hales, is a, um, a sleep sport coach, and he's worked, I mean, this is just an, an example of, all the, of some of the teams that he has worked for, um, mostly national teams and a range of sports from football to cycling to sailing um, to boxing. And so obviously um, he's helping their athletes just get that little bit of extra gain through optimizing their sleep. And um, already 10 years ago, in fact, this paper came out and it was basically saying that sleep recovery and performance is the new frontier in high performance athletics. And it's certainly being looked at very favorably at the moment. Because with sleep deprivation or restriction, as you now well know, um, it negatively affects your metabolic, your immune, and your um, restorative physiological processes. So for athletes, it makes sense that sleep be prioritized. And you'll recall the, the, in a, in the um, National Sleep Foundation guidelines um, for adults, they need to sleep seven to nine. But of course, this is for the general population. And so when it comes to athletes, their sleep need is often a lot longer than that. So it's quite different. So this is just a little um, infographic to um, highlight why exactly athletes need to sleep. On one hand, it's got the central nervous system effect. So remember I spoke about the um, neural plasticity as one of the main um, functions of sleep. And so that very much relates to memory and motor control or motor learning, which for obvious reasons is important for skilled um, sports. 
So that happens while we're asleep. We now know that it's incredibly important for the immune system, so athletes cannot afford to be sick prior to or during big competitions, um, or at least I think they can't afford to be. Um, it's important for energy store. Not only does our, does our brain gluco glucose stores be restored, but also our muscle um, resynthesizes glycogen, and it's obviously important for muscle recovery. So um, it's pretty clear why athletes would sleep. I really like the study, I'm just going to quickly show you. It had a look at whether extending sleep in young college um, athletes was able to have any um, significant impact on their performance. So when I think about college um, sports people, I'm thinking young people, I'm thinking they're probably a little bit irresponsible, so I wouldn't imagine that sleep is particularly good anyway, and I'm thinking that they're probably also nighttime people. So here it was a tiny, tiny, tiny study, so I'm going to definitely put that massive disclaimer on there. They just looked at 11 students, um, uh, uh, basketball players. I'll explain why the study was so small now. They were 19, they were young, and they did um, two to four weeks of baseline sleep in which they were slept about 69 hours in that time. And then they did a five to seven week ex extension intervention. So they coached them personally on how to make changes to improve their, their sleep and their sleep hygiene. And um, they actually noticed that they were able to increase their sleep by 180 um, minutes on average um, per night. So they were able, through the intervention, to increase sleep by two hours. That's radical. But I think there was room to play there because I think that their habits may not have been very good to start with. But what they noticed at the end of the intervention period is that their sprinting time was faster, they had better shooting accuracy, improved reaction times, um, less daytime sleepiness, and improved ratings of overall um, well-being and um, physical and mental well-being. So it's relatively obvious, I suppose, um, but it's really nice to see that if we make changes that we can actually have um, positive consequences um, uh, on our health and not just on protecting against disease. Right, I don't think I'm going to show you that, because that's boring. Okay, and the other thing that they also had a look at with these were young athletes, but um, they looked at here, yeah, this is likelihood of injury. So they followed them for a 21 month period, and they looked at the, and they classified them here by average sleep duration. And basically athletes who averaged less than seven hours per night, so basically seven, six, and five, they had 1.7 times greater risk of becoming injured over that 21-month um, period compared to those who were longer sleepers. So certainly, um, from an athletic perspective, it seems to be good against, uh, good to help promote um, well-being as well as reduce the risk for injury. We come to the end of today. <laughs> So, any more questions? We're all questioned out. <laughs> okay, so that leaves us with one last section to go tomorrow. We'll look at um, optimizing sleep. So, hopefully, it'll be a little bit practical. So, I guess the idea again around tomorrow is to make it. Um, when I say practical, but I want you to be able to take things home from tomorrow and think about your own sleep and your own habits and maybe those around you, people who don't have the best sleep, and hopefully you'll be able to share some of the sleep love. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Nick Little Hales, the Little Hales, the sleep coach. Oh, sorry.